Saint Ignatius of Antioch, also known as Ignatius Theophorus, is a first century Christian writer and patriarch of Antioch. In the Christendom world, Ignatius is a very prominent early Christian bishop, most popular for his letters before his death. I am going to share with you some very fascinating testimony from this very first century bishop who testifies that not all Christians believed in the crucifixion of Jesus, which is again, this view is reflected in the teachings of the Quran. And this is going to be shocking to many Christians. So stick around till the end as I respond to Christian apologists who claim that none of the early Christians denied the crucifixion, that according to first century Christians, Jesus was indeed crucified. <laughs> Greetings, good evening everyone, and welcome back to Blogging Tawheed. So while en route to Rome from Antioch, where he met his martyrdom, Ignatius wrote a series of letters. And one of those letters tell us about the beliefs of some people that Jesus was not crucified. This corresponds, forms a central part of a later collection of works by the Apostolic Fathers. Ignatius is considered one of the three most important of this, together with Clement of Rome and Polycarp. His letters also serve as an example of early Christian theology and address important topics including ecclesiology, the sacraments, and the role of bishops. Ignatius is traditionally described with his friend Polycarp as the disciple of Saint John the Apostle. Uh, Ignatius was a first century bishop and he was the second after Saint Peter according to tradition. Later, Ignatius was chosen to serve as Bishop of Antioch. The 4th century church historian Eusebius writes in this book, uh, The History of the Church, The History of the Church by Eusebius, he writes, he says, that Ignatius succeeded Evodius, or Eudias, who was the first bishop of Antioch, succeeding St. Peter. Uh, Theodoret of Cyrus claimed that uh, St. Peter him himself left directions that Ignatius be appointed to his episcopal. So what does this first century bishop Ignatius say? One of his letters found in this book uh, called um, Early Christian uh, writings. This is early Christian writings. It's uh, a penguin classics writings. This book is a must have as if you have been watching my videos, I've been referencing this book a lot recently, especially the video series about the Dadache, the lost or missing books that never made it to the canon and early Christian writings. So this, the book, Christian writing, the apostolic fathers, the early Christian writings, this is the reason this book is considered so valuable. Uh, the writing in this volume cast a glimmer of light up in the emerging traditions and organizations of the infant church during an otherwise little known period of its development. So I think uh, there is no true Christian who can read this works and mainly these two books and not be convinced and challenged, especially on what has become uh, as reflected in modern evangelicalism, since I think there is no actual Christianity in the West. Modern Christianity today seems at best an archaism hypocrisy, the Christian myth of a world deemed to death and suffering by human sin, then redeemed by Christ, is hard to square with our modern understanding of the cosmos. If you're looking to be challenged, this books, uh, 
have so much, so much interesting contents. One of the letters in this book is Ignatius' letter to the Magnesiums. And in section 9, in section 9, titled, in section 9, titled, Let Us Live With Christ, it says, and I quote, We have seen how former adherents of the ancient customs have since attained to a new hope. Ignatius here is talking about people who follow Judaism are becoming Christians. And their Jews who became Christians, according to Ignatius, have actually given, given up keeping the Sabbath. Well, they were not good Jews, were they, by giving up the Sabbath. So what makes you think they would be good Christians? So this so-called good people have given up keeping the Sabbath and now order their lives but by the Lord's Day instead. And the Lord's Day in the Christian calendar of course, is Sunday rather than Saturday. So they switched from the Jewish to the Christian calendar now. And then he says, and I quote, so that they have given up keeping the Sabbath and now order their lives by the Lord's day instead. The day when life first dawned for us, thanks to him and his death, meaning Jesus and his death. That death, though, Ignatius say, some deny it. That death, some deny it, though some deny it, is the very mystery which has moved us to become believers. So let me repeat that. That death, though some deny it, is the very mystery which has moved us to become believers. Christians today still use the same exact word for crucifixion and resurrection, mystery, as if we are not supposed to question the crucifixion or the resurrection. But, say remains a statement from Ignatius himself saying, and according to the context, I am aware that not all Christians at this time, meaning his time in the first century, believe that Jesus was crucified. Now, why would people in Ignatius' time deny the crucifixion of Jesus if it was witnessed by well over a million of people, as Flavius Josephus claimed? Josephus, the Roman historian, has often been charged historically with exaggerating numbers in his writings. Josephus even stated that twice that many people showed up in Jerusalem for the Passover holiday. But at any rate, this phrase, that death, though, that death, though some deny it, is the very mystery which has moved us to become believers. Meaning, Ignatius was aware of people in his lifetime, in the first century, who called themselves Jews and Christians, in the first century, that Jesus died on the cross, deny that Jesus died on the cross. And this is a remarkable first century testimony from a Christian believer, a prominent Christian about other people who did not agree with Ignatius. Now, Ignatius here, of course, condemns these people, but that's not my point. My point is they existed. And this is evidence that they existed from a prominent Christian source. This phrase, some deny it, Ignatius speaks of many people, those Jews who deny Christ altogether, and especially who deny the resurrection, as we know they did, they did from Matthew. He also speaks of first Christians who denied the crucifixion and resurrection. And this is my point from this entire video, is that Christian apologists claim they're not aware of first century Christians who denied Jesus' death. We know from Ignatius, there were Christians in the first century, during Ignatius' time, in the first century, who denied that Christ has come in the flesh, had risen in the flesh, was crucified or resurrected. 
This denial of Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and divinity carried on to the second century with the Basilidians who did not believe Jesus was in the flesh and as such did not believe Jesus was crucified. They followed the Gospel of Mark and interpreted it, uh, interpreted to be uh, teaching as such and more exactly that um, Jesus swapped places with Simon of Cyrene and this is mentioned in Mark uh, chapter 15 verse 20 and 22. So if the Gospel of Mark is a witness to crucifixion then it testifies to other Christians first century Gnostic Christians who denied the crucifixion of Jesus. Also early Christians, the Nazarenes, the Ebionites, uh, Syrinthians, etc. were Jewish followers of Yeshua, believed he was a prophet like Moses. The oppressors of the Israelites, the Gentiles, Greek and the Romans deviated from this, elevating Yeshua, Jesus, to a deity for it conformed to their religious standards. I am aware that Christian apologists paint a not so good picture of the Nazarenes and the Ebionites and the Corinthians, and that all that painting um, uh, was all false. Moreover, some early Christians did not believe in the physical cru crucifixion of Jesus uh, because they believed in a doctrine called Docetism which taught that Jesus only appeared to be human and did not have a physical body. They believed that the crucifixion was an illusion and that Jesus uh, did not actually suffer and die on the cross. This belief uh, was deemed heretical by um, other so-called Christian groups as there were many Christianities in plural at that time because Contrary to what many Christians think, early Christianity was divided into competing factions that believed quite different things about Jesus. Most first century Christians did not believe or agree on Jesus. If you look at the New Testament, for example, and I'm going to go off topic here for a minute, Mark's gospel fails to represent Jesus as in some way divine while other New Testament sources portray him as divine to the extent of his divine conception. And at least one New Testament source describes him as fully divine. Our earliest extent Christian writing may be Hebrews, which speaks of Jesus as the high priest in heaven. As for example, in Hebrews uh, chapter 8, verse 1, and it says, now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. For the author of the Hebrews, Jesus sat on the right hand of God, but he was not God. He is called the Son of God, but it is not thought of as divine. Even the ancient kings of Judah could be called sons of God. God the Almighty has sons by the tons in the Bible. On the other hand, Jesus had not lived on earth. Um, Hebrew chapter 8 verse 4, it says, For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. So Paul seems to have, seems to have held somewhat similar beliefs, although scholars debate whether he believed Jesus had lived on earth or whether Paul was just waiting for him to come soon. He says Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power in Romans 1 verse 4. He wrote of Jesus as the Son of God and in Philippians, like for example, in chapter 2 verse 5 and 6, said that he was in the form of God, spiritual, but thought he could be equal to God, choosing instead to take the form of a servant. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So Paul here seems to have been teaching that Jesus was in some sense divine, 
capable of being equal to God and therefore not God himself. Mark gospel, Mark's gospel, gospel which was written uh, next after uh, 70 Christian era, documents a quite a different picture, a different understanding of Jesus. Jesus is portrayed as the Son of God, apparently from his baptism, but not as God. He is even portrayed as denying that he is God in Mark uh, chapter 10, verse uh, 18, which says, And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Excuse me. So Mark's gospel remained the only gospel account from around 70 Christian era until at least the early 90s when Matthew appeared, right? So many scholars conclude that Mark portrays Jesus as a human adopted by God at the time of his uh, baptism. Mark chapter 10 verse 18 says, And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. It should be assumed uh, that those who learned their gospel from Mark would have seen this one statement as clarifying that Jesus was not God. Matthew and Luke, which appeared around the end of the first century, portrayed Jesus as the Son of God because of his divine birth. This made him a God-man, but not God. Born of the Virgin Mary, he would still have been seen by late first century students of these Gospels as half-human, like so many others in pagan mythology. We can dispute these perceptions, but this is how first century pagans who converted to Christianity would have seen Jesus. Now, John's gospel could not have influenced the views of first century Christians because it was written early in the second century, but it had a profound influence on future Christians. This gospel was the first account that saw Jesus as divine and pre-existing, although, although not necessarily as God. The Trinity, therefore, was a concept for the distant future. Christology evolved in the gospels that, Mark, that followed Mark. The gospel of Matthew and Luke portrayed Jesus as the Son of God from his conception, but not divine in the same way as God. Then, sometime early in the second century, the Gospel of John finally portrays Jesus as pre-existing and divine. The prologue, which I have been talking about as well, the prologue of John in John 1 verse 1 and 5, or uh, chapter 1 verse 9 and 14, which describes Jesus as divine, is believed to be a pre johannine hymn that was actually used by Roman pagans and philosophers pre-Jesus. Having said that, there was no sign of the divine Jesus in the first century. The Jews did not even have a concept of a God-man, so of course they didn't believe in the crucifixion and the resurrection mystery. And after John died, the people who came uh, to the fore were of Greek origin. And their trying demagogues were not long in putting an appearance. If you want to learn more about this issue, start with the first century, the first council of Nicaea, and then scroll through the ecumenical councils list, and then focus especially on the Chalcedon Council. What you will see is a robust debate with a lot of people on both sides, since both sides had tons of uh, scriptures in their defense. In the end, the emperor of Rome himself, not Christian, just made the call. Not scholars, scriptorians, or apostles, but the head of the army, who was getting sick of the fighting, made the call. It took Christians four centuries. Well, actually five centuries, because by the fourth century, they were still divided about the Holy Spirit. So it took Christians five centuries to work out who and what Jesus was. There was battles sometimes resulted in bloodshed. They were very political 
and usually settled either by a church council or by part of the church breaking off. The issues also involved the nature of the Trinity and the role of Mary, the fact that some of these issues have not been settled yet. The origin of the Holy Spirit is one of the issues that divides Catholics and Orthodox. Uh, the role of Mary divides Catholics and Protestants. Some of these ideological conflicts hinge of such a satiric ideas that this seem almost impossible to understand today. So back to Ignatius who testifies, um, this believers who denied Jesus died on the cross did actually exist. And the Quran of course says obviously that Jesus was not crucified. So the Quran is not the only one or the only source that confirms first century Christians that did not believe in the crucifixion. This is evidence from Ignatius himself that some first century Christians also did not believe that Jesus was horribly put to death on the cross. That in fact it might have appeared that he was crucified according to the Quran. But in fact God saved him. God supernaturally saved him from his enemies as indeed Jesus appeal to God according to the Gospels, that he would be rescued and God answered his prayer, that would be a must, which is the Muslim view. Now, on the other hand, in section 10, <clears throat> in section 10, Ignatius of Antioch, who is still remembered in the liturgy of the Orthodox Catholic Church, continues with one of the greatest ironies of history when it comes to Christianity. He says something very interesting in the same letter. This is Ignatius' letter to the Magnesians in section number 10, as it's called in this book. He says to the people he's writing to, and I quote, to confess Jesus Christ while continuing to follow Jewish customs is an absurdity. He says what now? He says to confess Jesus Christ while continuing to follow Jewish customs is an absurdity. He says the Christian faith does not look to Judaism, but Judaism looks to Christianity in which every other race and tongue that confesses their belief in God has now been comprehended. So according to Ignatius, to be a Christian means to deny Judaism. To do so is an absurdity because Christian faith does not look to Judaism. The Christian Gospels strongly um, disagrees with Saint Ignatius because Jesus himself did not come to abolish the law of Moses but to fulfill it and in the Gospel of Matthew Jesus said some very interesting things about the Jewish law and customs. For example in Matthew chapter 23 verse uh, the, the first four verses actually where Jesus denounces the scribes and the Pharisees these are Jewish people, of course. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees, they sat on Moses' seat. In other words, they teach the law. This is an authoritative statement. If you sit on Moses' seat, literally and figuratively, you are a teacher of the law. Therefore, says Jesus, do whatever they teach you, but do not do as they do, for they, not, they don't uh, practice what they preach, because they're hypocrites. They tie up heavy uh, burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulder. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move, uh, to move them. So Jesus is telling his disciples to obey the Jewish law. These are the 613 commandments given by God himself to Moses on Mount Sinai. Of course, you can read about this in the book of Exodus, and this is the Torah, the instruction, the teaching, the law given by God to Moses. Also, this is the same chapter 23, verse 13. It says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrite. 
So Jesus is saying the law has to be obeyed. This is not being abrogated. And indeed, in the very famous Sermon on the Mount, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says to his disciples, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not a single jot, not a stroke of a, of a pen will disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least, least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So the law is still to be followed, albeit in the way that Jesus did interpret. But the law itself is not to be abolished. And that's interesting, isn't it? What do you think now about Ignatius who tells Christians to abandon the law of the Torah? Ignatius seems to contradict Jesus in this early Christian writings. Uh, he says to confess Jesus Christ alone and not to follow Jewish customs. Doing so is an absurdity. The Christian faith does not look to Judaism, but Judaism looks to Christianity. So Jesus, however, advocating the practice of the Torah, and this is what Jews do even today, Orthodox Jews, obviously, try and follow the best uh, of their ability, the commandments of God found in the Torah. If we look at the book of Acts, we'll see that Peter was the first Pope according to the Catholic Church. Because the book of Acts mostly centered around Paul and it's more to do with the Acts of Paul than the Acts of the Apostles. Yet we know that James, the brother of Jesus, was the head of the church in Jerusalem. So Jesus, or James, uh, excuse me, so James is the only source to early religious practices and he was a practicing Jew who followed the Torah just like his brother Jesus. Not like Paul who had different views about the Jewish law and Paul upheld the law just like Ignatius. Paul was telling people not to follow the Torah and James went after him at one point saying, the, the Jews, have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. What shall we do? They will certainly hear what you have uh, come. So do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take this man, join in their pur purification rites, and pay their expenses so that they can have their he heads shaved. Then everyone will know there is no truth in these reports about you, but uh, that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. As for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food sacrificed to idols, uh, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. Uh, this is the story where Paul visits James at Jerusalem and they said to Paul, see how many thousands of believers they are among the Jews and they are all zealous for the law. So these are people who are coming into the church to the uh, Jesus movement. And what's remarkable about them, what James singles them out is that for their zealousness, their enthusiasm for the Torah. This is after Jesus left the scene. This is the early, the early, early church, of course. What's interesting is that Paul has been accused by people, according to Acts 21, of having taught false things about the law, telling people not to observe the law of Moses, to forsake Moses, as it says, not to circumcise their children, not to observe the customs of the Jews. Why does this matter? Because even Paul, according to Acts, as bearing witness that he upheld the law, we know from Paul's letters, like the Galatians, like Ephesians, 
that Paul said the law had been abolished. If you look up Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15, Paul says the law and his commandments has been abolished. So Paul dissembling here in Acts, Paul is lying again and bearing false witness. And this isn't just telling lies to James because he's pretended to undergo this purification in the temple before God. This passage is a historical proof that historically Paul lied, gave false testimony, and taught people to abandon circumcision and eat pork. All food is clean according to Paul. But this is not what Jesus and his brother James, the head of the church in Jerusalem, after Jesus taught. They were practicing Jews. And according to Josephus, the Jewish historian in the first century, he said that James was famous for his zeal for the law amongst the Jews themselves. And we know from other sources like Eusebius and Esipicus in the second century that James was known as the Torah, as a Torah observer. This was the faith of the early Christian community. They were practicing Jews. And then we come, of course, to Ignatius of Antioch, who says towards the end of his life um, that Christian faith does not look to Judaism. Don't practice Judaism, he says. We practice Christianity. Therefore, the religion of Jesus and his brother James, who headed the church, was what we would call today the Torah. Jesus did not preach Christianity, did he? Did James teach anything other than his brother's teaching? So why then did Ignatius say, do not follow that faith? Follow a different path. Follow Christianity. This is the first time the word Christianity ever appears in the world literature by the noun Christianity. A new religion being profoundly proclaimed by Ignatius on his way to martyrdom and a clear rejection of the religion of James and of the religion of Jesus. Remember Matthew chapter 23 where Jesus tells his disciples to listen to those who, who sit on Moses' seat, do whatever they tell you, Whatever they teach you, obey it, but don't do as they do because they're hypocrites. Remember that? They're Jews. They are Israelites. Uh, Bani Israel. They follow the Torah. Ignatius says, don't do that. This was the beginning of the very, very interesting, the emerging church, the Gentile church, because Ignatius was a Gentile, of course, and it completely disowns the parent faith of Christianity, which is Judaism. Ignatius now follows a different religion, not taught by either Jesus or James. Yet we see this emergence of Gentile Christianity, which claimed Jesus as its founder. They ejected the very religion of its founder, rejected it completely, explicitly and openly was early in the first century. Ignatius testifies the existence of early Christians who did not share his own belief and that they believed Jesus was not crucified. I believe the non-crucifixion of Jesus that is uh, clearly art articulated in the Quran is not making up beliefs that only came about in the 6th, 6th or 7th century. It's endorsing that early Christians, 1st century Christians who held that belief as well that Jesus was not crucified. This testimony came from a 1st century witness in this book from an emerging Trinitarian church about the non-crucifixion of Jesus on the cross. A view that is expressed in the Quran, they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. Till next time, greetings of peace, mercy, and blessings. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. تخذوني وأمي إلهين من دون الله قال سبحانك ما يكون لي أن أقول ما ليس لي بحق إن كنت قلت فقد علمته 
تعلم ما في نفسي ولا يعلم ما في نفسك إنك أنت علم